Welcome everyone to the Littoral Zone podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. The Littoral Zone, or shoal area of a lake, is the place where the majority of the action takes place. My podcast is intended to do the same, put you where the action is to help you improve your stillwater fly fishing. On each broadcast, I, along with guests from all over the world, will be providing you with information, tips and tricks, flies, presentation techniques, and from time to time, some different lakes for you to consider exploring. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Please feel free to email me with your Stillwater-related fly fishing questions and comments at flycraft at shaw.ca. I do my best to answer as many as we can prior to each episode, just before the main content. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy today's episode. This is Dave, your Wet Fly Swing podcast host, Phil Roy, back for another huge episode of the Littoral Zone today. This is our chance to break down stillwater fishing from one of the best, so you have the tools you need for success this season. Today's episode is sponsored by Daiichi Fishing Hooks, a leader in the fly fishing industry and still the world's sharpest hook. Tempered with carbon-rich steel, Daiichi offers superior penetration without compromising the hook's structural integrity. You can head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash Daiichi and check out what they have going and check out these killer hooks. That's Daiichi, D-A-I-I-C-H-I. Today's episode is sponsored by Trestle, who you know from their game-changing telescopic fly rod roof rack systems. But did you also know that Trestle just released the only universal bike rack system designed exclusively for the angler and outdoorsman? You can check out this new universal rack system at wetflyswing.com slash trestle right now to see their full line of gear carrying products and the artist series apparel. That's trestle, T-R-X-S-T-L-E. Trestle, live your pursuit. Today, it's part one of a two-part series focused on understanding stillwater fly lines, making sense of stillwater fly lines, if you will. But before we get into today's episode, I just want to thank those of you that have reached out and provided your words of support and encouragement to the content you've been listening to on my podcast. It really makes me feel good to know that the, what I'm putting out there is providing value and hopefully helping everyone on the water the next time they get out on the lake. I also want to provide special thanks to those of you such as Guy Washburn, who asked for a specific podcast focused on Eastern still water techniques. I'm happy to report this topic is already on my list for a future episode. If you've got ideas about episodes you'd like to hear or subject matter, again, please let me know and I'm happy to add them to my list and expound on them some more. So let's get into today's episode, Making Sense of Stillwater Fly Lines. Okay, let's jump into this one and let Phil do his best mic drop as we head out onto the water. If you have questions anytime, you can reach out to Phil or me. You can head over to wetflyswing.com or check in with Phil. Whether you're relatively new to still water fly fishing or perhaps you've been fly fishing lakes for many years like myself, you certainly notice the difference between still water fly fishing demands and equipment as you do with other disciplines of fly fishing, such as tropical saltwater fly fishing, euro nymphing, bass on the fly, uh, spay, salmon, steelhead, all of these uh, differences, uh, disciplines rather, and especially rivers and streams. Of course, obviously the first one that comes to mind is rivers and streams. The water moves and in lakes, the water doesn't move nearly as much. It does move a little bit, so that still water name it's been given is perhaps a little misleading, but it certainly doesn't move. The water certainly doesn't move as compared to rivers and streams. The other thing you notice too with different disciplines of fly fishing is the equipment demands, rods, leaders, and especially fly lines. And when it comes to lakes, a lot of people are overwhelmed by the sheer volume of fly lines that are out there. And it can be a little daunting, a little scary, both from which lines do I need and when do I need them? And of course, the financial implications of all of those lines as well. So today on part one of Making Sense of Stillwater Fly Lines, we're going to give you a little bit of understanding throughout both uh, part one and part two, why you need multiple lines to be consistently successful on lakes. Today, we're going to review how fly lines are made. We're going to talk about uh, some in-depth discussion, particularly with floating lines, about fly line tapers. We're going to talk about the cores that are used as well, because that impacts how the line behaves and the uses it can be considered for. And then we're going to walk through today the floating line types. We're going to go through the different floating lines to consider. We're going to go through some midge tips, emerger tips, clear tips, 
um, those kind of lines as well. And the overall goal of these two sessions is to give you the education and understanding so when you go to purchase a fly line, you can make the best choice you can and get value for your investment. Because it's not always easy to find out good information on still water fly lines. No disrespect to the uh, fly shops out there, but some of them don't have a lot of lake uh, fly fishing in their area, or maybe it's a blend of lake, river, and other types of fly fishing. And maybe they understand those disciplines quite well, but they don't understand the still water fly fishing as well. And so it's hard to get information. So that's what this is about today, is just to make you a more informed fly fisher. So when you go into a store and you see a new line or you see a certain line, you know what it's all about, what it could be used for, and if it would be value. Again, to get value for your investment. So when we compare rivers and lakes, if you come from a river and stream environment, you soon realize that you know, you don't need a lot of lines to be successful on a river. If you're a trout fisherman, a good floating line will last you a lifetime or certainly a long time. And that floating line will allow you to fish dries and emergers. You can fish nymphs. You can fish streamers. You can do all kinds of things with that floating line. So the multiple lines aren't necessary. Now, of course, if you're a dedicated streamer fisherman and you want to get into some of the uh, intermediate lines, the shooting head, the integrated lines, things like that, then you maybe step up a little bit. Or if you get into European nymphing, you're going to get a Euro line as well. But for the average river and stream fly fisher, a good floating line will last them a long time and allow them to present their fly using a variety of different techniques. But when it comes to lakes, well, if you've been doing it a while, we carry a comprehensive suite of fly lines, meaning we carry a lot. And we carry different line types from floating all the way down to the fastest sinking. Um, You know, if you look at competition fly fishing, There's a lot of line choices they use there. And I often ask in in some of my seminars and club presentations, how many lines do you think a competitive angler takes on the water with them? And, you know, a variety of different guesses, but it's not inconceivable to carry an excess of 30, 40, even 50 fly lines, all different types, different line manufacturers had different lines that worked in certain circumstances, just like fly rod. You had that certain fly rod that really performed in that one situation. You can think fly lines for lakes behave the same way. Myself, personally, I carry over 20 lines with me in my kit bag at any one time. So as I go through all these line types throughout these two episodes, I'll be sort of doing a bit of a running count of how many lines I've got and how we're building and how you can get up to that 20 lines. And I will also be providing you with a critical path, sort of a right through selection of the three fly lines you should consider having with you at all times and then you can fill in the blanks after that as your needs and wants uh, dictate. You know one of the things we also say as well is only the paranoid survives. So what I mean by that you know if you're fishing on a body of water or fishing with someone else and they've got a certain fly line and they're performing really well with it and you don't have it You get a little paranoid because you don't have it and you certainly want to go out and uh, get that line because you've seen it perform and you want to add that to your kit bag. So the next time you're on the water and things aren't going according to plan with the suite of fly lines, fly lines rather, that you usually use, you now have this new line you can pull out and hopefully solve the riddle that Mother Nature and the trout are throwing at you in any one day. But there's many options and the choices can be overwhelming. And again, it's all about making the right decision and getting value for that investment. Because if you're going to purchase a line... And don't understand how it performs, how it behaves, when to use it, what situations, and it just sits in your kit bag or sits on a shelf and collects dust. It's a waste of money and you're not getting value for that line. You know, if you're going to buy a line, then you want to going to learn how to use it. And then when a situation comes up that this might be the solution, this line might be the solution to the presentation challenges, then you can pick it out of your kit bag. You've got some confidence in it and you're going to use it. So when it comes to still water fly fishing, sometimes lately we get stereotyped because everybody thinks, you know, particularly if you don't still water fly fish, that the only way we fly fish lakes is with a strike indicator and a floating line. And we're certainly going to talk about that in this episode because it is a deadly presentation technique that I use all the time, but it's not the only way to catch fish when you're fly fishing lakes. So fly lines that we have out there at our disposal for lake fishing, we have floating lines for different floating line situations. We have midge tip or emerger tip lines or clear tip lines, depending on the manufacturer and the trade name they use for their particular line. We have fly lines that sink slowly. We have fly lines that sink fast. We have fly lines that sink as well and then sweep through the water in an arc to cover differing depths throughout the retrieve. We have density compensation to consider in the sinking lines. 
and throughout almost all line types nowadays, uh, certain manufacturers have low stretch lines as well. And I love low stretch lines, and we'll talk more about those in a minute. So why do you need so many different fly line types for still water fly fishing? You know, what are we talking about here? Well, first of all, we got to deal with wind. Many people sort of curse it, but it's actually your friend. And I always joke, wind is a bit like a, you know, a new puppy, a new lab or golden retriever or other kind of dog. Um, I'm, I happen to be a retriever lab lover. But uh, when they're puppies, they're cute. You want to cuddle them, but they come over. They're all over you. They're biting you. They're scratching you. They're nipping at you. They won't sit still. They're all over the place. That's kind of like how wind is. We want a little bit of wind to help our presentations, but typically we get nothing or gale force. So no matter those scenarios, we do have to deal with wind and a weight forward line certainly helps manage the wind. It also helps you cast distance because other than uh, fishing indicator techniques, we need to cover as much water as we can when we're still water fly fishing. So that means the further we can cast or the line helps us to cast that distance, the more water we can cover and expose our flies to fish and hopefully catch more fish. You know, years ago, when I first started out, double taper lines were all a rage. And if you're not familiar with a double taper line, it was basically the same thickness along its entire length, each end tapered down to where you either attach it to your backing or to your leader, and that's how you fish. So these lines, you know, one of the uh, proponents of double taper lines is a more delicate presentation when fishing to surface feeding fish, particularly in rivers and streams, short distance, accurate casting. And uh, But you also had to cast a lot to get that line speed built up to cover any distance. So a weight forward line has the weight concentrated in the first 30 to 40 feet, depending on the manufacturer and the line type. And that mass helps cast the line. Once you get that head out of the guides, out of your tip section, that's loaded the rod, and then you're gonna let the rest go. You're gonna shoot to the target because the line behind the head is level running or shooting line, depending on the manufacturer and what they call it. And that's designed to you know trail behind once that you get that head aerialized, get the uh, line speed built up and sent that off to the target. That running line runs behind. You have that stripped off the reel, organized on the deck or on your apron, your float tube or on the shore, wherever you're fishing from, and you shoot that off to the target. You don't want to be casting into the running line section because the cast is going to start collapsing. That uh, profile is not designed for casting and soon things start to fall apart and everything goes to heck in a handbasket. The other thing that uh, we have to consider as well is the depth of the water. Lakes are certainly deeper than most rivers and streams, just about all of them. <laughs> um, there are some deep rivers out there, the big ones, but we've got to be able to deal with that too. So we need lines to sink at uh, different rates so we can um, attack and present our flies at different depths to catch the fish that we're trying to catch. The retrieve speed also plays into that for sinking lines because the slower you retrieve your fly... And most things in lakes don't move all that fast. So this is a common reality. Um, you need to have a line that's going to sink slowly as well. So the sink rate of the line doesn't overpower the horizontal retrieve speed you're using to imitate the scuds, the dragonfly nymphs, the damselfly nymphs, whatever you're trying to um, imitate. Because if your line sinks too fast, you're just simply going to pull your leader and fly or flies down along the bottom and not be successful. You're going to be dredging up lots of neat things, but you're not going to be catching any fish. Uh, fish activity is also closely correlated to retrieve speed. When the fish are more active, they're willing to chase, they're aggressive, we can use faster retrieves, which means we can use faster sink rate lines because we can move the fly faster. But if the fish are not in an active state or perhaps feeding on something that uh, doesn't move very fast, like coronamids, then we have to match the fish activity with the presentation we're using with our flies and consequently that has an impact on which lines we're going to choose as well. There's also lines needed for specific presentation techniques and tactics like a, a, we're going to talk about it in a few minutes but like um, using strike indicator techniques we're going to need a specific line um, to help carry that indicator those long skinny leaders we like to use swivels weighted flies a little bit of split shot all kinds of things we put on the leader. We also want to be versatile. I'm a huge believer in being versatile. In fact, in one of my presentations, I call it don't be a one-trick pony. In other words, don't get sort of tunnel vision, if you will, and only approach a lake using one presentation technique, well, for example, strike indicators. That's all you use. They're certainly going to work a lot of times, but there are going to be certain circumstances where that's not the right presentation option, or there are other things that will work as well or equally better. So it pays to be versatile. And so you get these different lines that allows you to do that. And what I'll say at this point, when you, again, harping back to 
getting different fly lines is when you get one, play around with it, use it. And the best time to do this is when the fishing is pretty good. You've caught a number of fish. The fish are definitely active. They're willing to play. Um, you're getting them with your favorite presentation technique or tactic, your favorite line. Try taking that new line out and playing with it then. Get the hang of it. How does it work? What different, you know, how fast does it sink? How neat, all the different retrieves that go with it. Different options, things like that. Then you'll get some confidence with that line. And the next time you're out in the water, maybe conditions are a little more challenging and the fish aren't so uh, willing to play. Then you got to work a little harder and then you'll try different techniques or maybe pull out that new line because you've caught fish on it before. You have confidence that this line will work in certain situations. Maybe today's one of those situations. You really don't want to try a new presentation technique or a new line when fishing is tough because if things aren't working, you don't know whether it's the fish, the line, your presentation techniques, your retrieves, all of those kind of things. You have no real way of knowing why things aren't working. But again, if you've used that line before you're familiar with it you're comfortable with it it's worked for you before when you run into those tough days you're more likely to pull it out and at least have the confidence to go no this works well that factor is in control then you can work on other things that may be limiting your catch rate and of course good old personal preference comes into it as well and as i mentioned i carry personally a lot of fly lines with me probably 20 maybe 21 We'll do the final inventory as I walk through the different line types. Again, personal preference comes in, and I like to carry a lot of fly lines because I like to be prepared for every situation I can come in. And some days, I'll be honest, I might fish one way, and I've done that for a little while, and I just get, you know, maybe I'm fishing indicators, and it's been staring at that little uh, floating ball or tapered indicator for a long enough, and maybe I'm getting cross-eyed or I close my eyes and I'm starting to see fluorescent orange and pink spots in my eyes because I've been looking at those indicators for so long. I might try another line just to break up um, the day a little bit and try something new and see if it'll work. So personal preference comes in so you can have those lines to take to, to do that very thing. So when you look at fly lines, it's important to understand them. Like, you know, they're just not this plastic line, if you will, comes in a box and you put it on a reel and you take it fishing. It's important to understand them because different line um, requirements and, uh, you know, the operating environment you're going to put them in influences the design the fly line manufacturers use. So basically, if you were to cut a fly line in half or a section out of it, it would look like a bagel, a little um, inner circle surrounded by a larger circle. So the larger circle is the outer coating. And the outer coating is where the weight or the density is placed. In the case of sinking lines with tungsten powders, or if it's a floating line, it'll have little microspheres to help make that line buoyant and stay on the surface. Um, it'll have dye in it in the outer coating as well for the different colors that uh, manufacturers like to use. It'll have silicone or another uh, agent that allows it to build up slickness and, and travel through the guides efficiently. And of course, every manufacturer has that little proprietary dash of magic that makes their line unique for the challenges as well. So you'll consider purchasing it. Um, there's not a lot of strength in the, the coating itself. The core is where the strength is, and cores come in different types. You can have multi-filament cores, like a Dacron-based core. You can have braided mono, you can have mono, and you can have low-stretch cores. And they all have a time and a place, and again, a little bit of personal preference comes in there as well. So your stiffer cores, like a monofilament type core, they help you provide tight loops because they'll build up good line speed, good distance capability to shoot a long way. These lines are popular in warmer environments because your multi-filament Dacron cores do not do terribly well in really hot conditions. So they kind of turn to butter and don't perform very well. Conversely, if you take a line that's uh, designed for using um, in warmer uh, tropical situations and bring it into a temperate environment, it struggles. And I remember years ago when the first clear intermediates came out, and this really wasn't a uh, Stillwater example. Every fall when I lived on the west coast of British Columbia, we would go out and chase returning salmon on the fly. Chums, sockeye, if we could get them, are always tough. Pink salmon, and especially coho or silver salmon. And they like to hold up in, in slower water. We used to call it frog water. Very clear, and they could get spooky. And if you're using a solid color line, they would actually, you would cast to them. You could see them and amongst them, and they would actually part around your fly line and sort of swell back together after it passed through the water. Um, so we became aware of these clear intermediate lines and started using them. They were mono cores designed for a tropical environment. And when we started using them in cool temperate environments where it's near freezing or pretty darn cold or damp cold conditions, 
Although that line was invisible, holy smokes, it turned into a slinky when it got in those cool conditions. And it was a real challenge to operate with. It would tangle a lot. Yes, we caught fish, but it uh, certainly wasn't fun to use. Nowadays, of course, they've designed clear intermediates with that temperate climate in mind, and they perform very, very well. But a monofilament core always needs a little bit of stretch. No matter the manufacturer, I always recommend if you're going to use your mono lines, your mono you know, clear intermediates, and that's why they, the clear intermediates use the mono, because monofilament is clear. Otherwise, if you didn't have a clear core, you couldn't have a clear outer coating either. Because the outer coating is actually white in many instances, and then when it's dried, then it goes clear. Of course, they also, as I mentioned earlier, put the dye in there as well for certain lines as well. But you want to make a clear line, you need a clear core. Supple cores have low memory. They perform really well in cool to cold environmental conditions. So again, you've got to factor in when you're looking at fly lines, not just for still water fly fishing, but all disciplines, what you're going to use it for. And that's why you'll see a manufacturer has a line for tropical lines, and they'll have bass lines, and they'll have still water lines, they'll have river and stream lines, all these different things, because the manufacturer is making tailor making lines to meet your needs on the water so you'll have more enjoyment out there today's episode is sponsored by maverick fly fishing they make the lightest zero nip reel in the world which makes your rod more sensitive casting more accurate and you can hold your dead drifts longer without the shoulder burn this reel is so unique you may not even recognize it as a fly reel i had a chance to fish the stinger reel with jeff on his home river on the truckie the biggest thing that I remember is the weight. The weight really stuck out because you can't even barely tell there's a reel. It's essentially kind of like you're holding a rod all day long. I mean, it's that light. And uh, and when you're Euro nipping, that is a key. And the other big thing I remember from that day was catching uh, a fish on my first cast. Pretty cool to be down in that part of the country and, and have some great success with Jeff. Maverick keeps things simple by offering a Euronymph product line with essentials you'll need from rod, reel, fly line, and leader system. Euronymphing doesn't have to be complicated, so let Maverick Fly Fishing get you started right now. You can learn more by checking out Maverick's YouTube channel for some tips and tutorials. And you can also head over right now to wetflyswing.com slash maverick to check out the good stuff they have going. That's Maverick, M-A-V-R-K wetflyswing.com slash maverick to support this podcast and take a look at one of the most unique and efficient euro nipping setups on the market okay back to the show so another thing to think about are profiles and tapers because one profile or line taper doesn't fit all situations different presentation challenges require different line profiles and tapers to be successful for example you need a different line profile and taper to cast indicators and long leaders versus, you know, the accuracy and delicacy required for fishing dries or emerges or lightly small or lightly weighted or unweighted nymphs. So a short taper, an abrupt short taper, maybe three feet long. And the taper I'm referring to is right at the end of the fly line where you're going to attach your leader. It tapers down from the head section to the uh, welded loop or the end of the line where you attach your leader. The shorter that taper is in length, the more abrupt the turnover, it facilitates a fast turnover of the fly line. It keeps the weight at the front. It's good for, you know, a lot of times these lines are popular for close range fishing out of drift boats and things like that for indicators, that kind of thing. Um, but it also that mass of the short front taper and keeping all that weight concentrated helps turn over indicators, level leaders that are common with indicator presentations. We'll talk about indicator presentations in a future episode because it can be quite complex. It's not just sticking an indicator on a leader and going fishing. There's way more to it than that. It's probably the most complex uh, still water system I use. But in addition to indicators, we love to fish long leaders as well. I do anyway. We call it the naked technique because there's no indicator on the leader. And frankly, if I was only limited to fish lakes with one line, it would be a floating line because a floating line, you know, you may have to make some compromises. So you, you'll have a line that can do a good job for you, maybe not an excellent job, but a good job for you turning over long leaders and indicators, but also do a decent job fishing at the surface using dries or emergers or perhaps fishing shallow water situations with lightly or unweighted nymphs as well. But these um, short turnover lines, short taper lines, we're going to get into that a little bit more in a few seconds talking about indicators. 
You also will have lines that have long front tapers. So as opposed to maybe a three feet being a short taper, a long front taper might be 10 feet in length. And this facilitates the slow turnover of the fly line. It gets delicate casts. You know, one of my lines I like to use when I'm fishing drives and emergers or in shallow, clear situations with small nymphs, uh, as I mentioned, lightly weighted or unweighted nymphs, I use a lot of real lines, full disclosure here, is the um, Elite, um, oh, I've lost the name here. It used to be the uh, LT, but it's, uh, anyway, it's their, I'm sorry, their, their presentation line. It'll come to me in a second, I'm sorry. But that line, it has a long front taper. It turns over very, very well. And it's perfect situation for casting. And I'll give you an example of this. I was fishing recently a school with good friend Brian Chan at Corbett Lake in British Columbia. And uh, beautiful shallow shoals on this lake, crystal clear, classic drop-offs, fast drop-offs into deep water, 20, 30, 40 feet. Fish love to cruise the edges of these drop-offs and, of course, go venture onto the shoal and feed. And there could be feeding in two feet of water, three feet, four feet, five, six, very shallow. If you use a line that's going to land heavy, you're going to spook them. So I was using a line more suited for the elite technical trout. There you go. It's popped back in my head um, for that situation because of its delicate presentation. It had a long front taper and allowed that casting energy to dissipate nicely, get that nice turnover and little to no risk of spooking fish by having that line crash aggressively on the surface. Uh, a long back taper. There's also a front taper. There's also a back taper on the fly line too, where that head section tapers into that level running line we talked about earlier. The longer that back taper, that gives you better roll casting. It also gives you the ability to pick up longer lengths of line. And this comes into play when perhaps you are casting to surface feeding um, trout, feeding on emergers, adults, things like that. You get a fish to rise, you cast to it, nothing happens. And then another fish rises within range that you want to pick up and cover it. If you're using a, a, a weight forward line that doesn't have a long back taper, you have to strip that line back in quickly, get that head into the guides a little bit, make a couple of false casts, get the mass of that head to flex and load the rod and present the fly to the target. Well, by the time you do all that, there's a pretty good chance that that fish has moved on and you've missed the opportunity. But with a long back taper, you can pick up a lot more line, make one pickup, turn, pivot, and place that fly in the vicinity of the fish and hopefully get the take. So that long back taper also comes into play as well. So let's move on a little bit and let's talk about low stretch lines because you are going to um, see those from time to, you know, different manufacturers. I believe Rio, well, I know Rio has their uh, no stretch lines, Airflow it does as well. And why do we need these? What's the big deal with them? Well, first of all, your regular multi-filament cores can stretch up to 30%. That's a lot of stretch or elasticity, if you will. These low stretch lines stretch a fraction of that, maybe about 5 or 6%. So why is that important? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is sensitivity. With less stretch in the line, a fish that grabs your fly, you have a better chance of picking up those subtle, almost imperceptible takes. And this is a common place when fish are feeding on small food items that don't move very fast. Again, the classic example in stillwater fly fishing are coronamids. They just swim up to one of those, looks good, inhale, swallow, move on to the next one. They're not going to crush it. So you need to have a line with, uh, you need to have good skills to pick up those takes and a, a low stretch line is going to help you. Low stretch lines will help your casting as well. You'll build up better line speed. It's going to better load that rod, allow you to have a better, more controlled cast and cover further distances. Hook set. When you get, uh, feel that take, there's no loss or give in the fly line. When you set the hook, you're going to get a good firm hook set. Now, some may argue, yeah, you can break fish off. But again, your rod comes in there as well, too, because personally, I like a rod that's not super fast. I like, let's call it moderate fast. It has a a rather softer forgiving tip and that's going to absorb your strike a little bit as well not to the point that it works against the low stretch line but it's also going to resist you having breakoffs it's just you get a touch with it frankly i've i've had very good luck with it um it's worked right from day one it's not been an issue i do i break fish off sure but it's usually lots of other reasons as well sometimes it's excitement and setting too aggressively but a lot of times it's other things stepping on fly lines poor knots um poor uh, leader material that's old and worn, all those kind of things. The other benefit to low stretch lines is fighting when you're fighting a fish, because the actions you use to defeat the fish, the changing of the rod angles, all of those things, they're more efficiently transferred down to the fish 
where you can tire the fish quicker in a catch and release scenario. We can get that fish in, get it revived and get it on its way again. So again, I love low stretch lines for those reasons. I'm a, a big proponent of them. I really feel they do make a difference and, and I really enjoy using them. So let's talk about um, the specific lines. Today, we're going to go through floating lines. We're going to talk about floating lines for indicators. We're going to talk about floating lines for fishing the naked technique, no indicator presentations, and floating lines for dries in emergers. And perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, fishing unweighted or slightly weighted nymphs in shallow situations. And then we're going to talk about your clear tip and midge tip lines. And then next episode, we're going to talk to you about sinking lines. And again, at the end of all this, we'll have a running count. You can see how my lines added up to over 20. And, uh, but we're going to give you that critical path as to which three lines you can start your fly line, in, your still water inventory with and build it up from there. So let's talk about floating lines for indicators in the naked technique. You know, the reality of uh, fly fishing lakes, the lakes I am fortunate enough to fish across Western Canada, North America, you know, Canada, United States, East, West Coast, down into Argentina. Most of the times we are fishing subsurface either fishing weighted flies on longer leaders, the naked technique, or fishing under an indicator. We just don't get the dry fly opportunities our river and stream colleagues to, but we're going to talk about that in a second because when we do get those opportunities, we certainly want to be prepared for them. So when you're looking for a line to cast an indicator or the naked technique, this is when you want to look for a line that's been designed for that situation. So we're fortunate today that manufacturers have made lines more tailor-made to our demands and, and requirements for still water fly fishing, but also other line types to look for that help that have the profile necessary to carry indicators and long leaders are lines designed for casting big wind-resistant flies, big streamers, big dries, large flies, cast in windy conditions, those kind of things. So those lines, and more specifically the ones now we have at our disposal designed for still water fly fishing, have a head design and taper to aid turning over an indicator, long leaders, swivels, multiple flies, all of those kind of things. So we need mass to do that. So that's where you're going to see lines specifically designed for still water fly fishing indicators and long leaders. You're going to see them with oversized heads, maybe a line weight, more line weight and a half or even two line weights. Now, everybody always worries that, uh, you know, that's somehow going to damage the rod. It's not. Overlining a rod was a common thing uh, many years ago where you would literally use a fly line perhaps even two line weights heavier than the manufacturers, than the rod you were using. Sometimes you use underline it. It depends on the rod, your casting style, the line itself. But for the most part, I'm a, you know, believe that the line manufacturers and the rod manufacturers know way more than I do about uh, these kind of things. So a six weight on a six weight line, six weight rod rather. But the head section is usually at least one and a half to two times heavier plus in conjunction with that uh, short front taper to turn over these long leaders, swivels, and all the other things we like to put on our leader setups indicators as well. And it's not a big deal. You know, the difference between a line weight is about 18 grains, which is the weight of a business card in the head area. So, you know, it's not that big a deal that you think it is, but it does pay dividends when you're using these kind of line setups. It's really the front taper. If you try to use a line that has a long front taper that's best suited for dries and emergers, you're going to find it struggling to cast really long leaders and particularly indicators and indicator rigs with lots of weight contact points on there as well. You'll also find the line diameter on these lines is a little bigger and that helps facilitate mending because when I'm fishing either indicators or the naked technique, I use the wind to help present my fly, wind drifting or moving the strike zone, I call it. And when we do that, we mend. We want to stay in contact with our flies, have our rod tip pointed right at the end of our line or at the indicator, and we really don't want a big sea to form caused by the wind-induced current. Just like when you fish wet flies or dries on rivers and streams, we're not looking for a drag-free float necessarily, but we are looking to stay in contact and not have that sea form, because particularly when you're using indicators, when that sea forms, and, and naked too, when that sea starts to form and gets quite pronounced, the tip section of the line is trying to catch up with the belly of the line, with the sort of the apex of the C is, if you will. And that's going to cause your flies to increase speed. And in worst case scenarios, can also get them to climb up through the water. And then you're not reaching the depth you're trying to target with. So we use reach casts, we mend, 
So we have a nice controlled sweep or swing as those that line and flies drift downwind. And again, with indicators, I call it moving the strike zone. When we're using the naked technique, I call it wind drifting. We're almost letting the wind help you fish the flies and cover water with a static or near static technique. So the line diameter to facilitate mending comes in really handy there. When you're fishing indicators, I'm a big proponent of using the roll cast. So a roll cast, these lines are suited for that because again, of that line diameter, more friction on the surface to help load the rod, which is what is necessary for a good roll cast. The long back taper allows you to roll cast further distances with more line out, but roll casting is an important part of an indicator presentation technique because let's be honest, it's a tangle prone system. You've got an indicator, a good indicator uh, setup is a level thin leader from indicator to flyer flies, so that's tangle prone. You might have a small swivel in there, You've got perhaps multiple flies if you're allowed, weighted flies. All these things work together to cause some pretty horrific tangles at times if you're not careful. So a roll cast works really well in those scenarios because the indicator, leader, and flies, and all the other accessories with that system only come out of the water on that final push to a stop to present the fly. You're also going to look for color. A lot of the manufacturers change colors on the fly lines. So it helps you identify where the head section starts and finishes, where the running line is, all of those kind of things that help you with your casting. It also helps you gauge distances, particularly with indicator fishing. I don't like to fish long distances. My general rule when I indicator fish is the deeper I am fishing beneath the indicator, the closer I keep it to my boat, pontoon boat, or float tube, or whatever I'm fishing out of, or the shore. Although usually when we're fishing from shore, we're not really fishing terribly deep unless we're off a really steep shoreline. And that's simply because the distance between the indicator and the fly, there's a delay when the fish takes the fly for that to get transmitted up to the leader and for you to react. And if you have cast too far away, you're not going to be able to see those subtle takes. And even if you do see them, you don't have the time to react to them because that fish can sample that fly, immediately realize it's made a mistake and expel it in the blink of an eye and you miss the opportunity. When I'm fishing shallower, I cast a little further away. But my a long indicator cast for me on a calm day, a light ripple where I can see the indicator clearly, fishing perhaps shallower, might be 30, 40 feet away max. Most times it's a lot closer so I can react a lot quicker. If you're not jumping up and down and stomping around in your boat or your pontoon boat or making a noise, those fish will come in quite close to you um, as long as you don't disturb them. So again, that line coloration helps you identify where that head section starts and finishes and use that as a gauge for your distance as well. And these also, these um, oversized line weights in the head section, fast action rods, rods that don't bend all that much, you know, tip flex, if you will, they need a little heavier line mass, a little contradiction there perhaps or more line mass is a better term to help cast them so these uh, characteristics all come into play with your floating line for indicators and naked so i typically have two lines suited for this because it's quite common for myself to both have an indicator presentation rigged up and to have a long leader naked presentation and when i'm talking long leaders if you're not familiar with this method we're talking minimum 15 feet 18 20 25 feet at times so it's quite common, particularly in early spring when coronamid fishing is, is uh, sort of at its apex or most popular. I can be fishing coronamids um, using uh, floating lines and long leaders and weighted flies, or I can be fishing them using uh, strike indicators. So I'll have two rods rigged and ready to go because we're creatures of habit and path of least resistance. So rather than having to take one setup apart and then restring and put up a new setup, if you have them rigged and ready to go, you just put one down, reel it in, put it down, pick up the other one and you're fishing again and you're more likely to make that change. So I've got two lines ready for that as well. So there's two right off the get-go. Now, of course, there's dries and emerger opportunities or fishing lightly weighted nymphs, a scenario I talked about earlier at uh, Corbett Lake, fishing uh, small mayfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs in very shallow water. Most times in those scenarios, I'm going to be, uh, you know, looking for signs of fish, trying to cast in their general area. I want a fly that's going to obviously sink in the water but not sink so fast that it's into the bottom weeds and debris and I'm not fishing very much I'm just more gardening than anything else so I do want a line specific for fishing dries and emergers and those lightly weighted nymphs so that's going to be a line as I mentioned the line I like to use is that real elite technical trout in the uh, this line has a long 10 foot front taper delicate dissipation of casting energy 
It's going to land delicately. Now, this is a line I may not, it's a line designed for river and stream fishing. And for lakes, that's fine to use those kind of lines. The lines we want to design for specific floating line challenges or lakes are directed at fishing subsurface presentations. I just finished mentioning that naked technique or strike indicator technique. But a good floating line that you would use on rivers and streams will do you double duty on lakes as well. So we want that long front taper so we can get those delicate presentations. Because when we're fishing dries and emergers, the closer we can be to our target, the more accurate we can be. If we see a fish rise at 70 feet, the chances of us, it's like a quarterback trying to hit the long bomb. It's very exciting when it happens, but it's a low percentage play as opposed to a short check down pass. It's a lot easier to complete. So when you've got fish rising and you've got fish rising in predictable rise patterns, you know, coming up every 10 feet and getting closer and closer and closer, you want to have a floating line that's going to land delicately and allow you to get that short cast on target so you can hook that fish. So very uh, important for those kind of things. And typically we're not dealing with as much wind. I find most of my best dry and emerger fishing is on a calm day or a lightly rippled day. The fish seem to rise a little better. Sometimes I wonder if it's too much surface chop kind of screws up their targeting system. I definitely have my best success or the most opportunities to fish dries on those days. For me personally to fish dries and emergers, there has to be some significant surface activity because a lot of times just basic presentation as on rivers and streams, you're often best suited to match the emerging nymphs or pupa because the trout feed on those way more than they do on those rising um, trout rising to, uh, you know, emergers uh, stuck in transition or adults or spinners in the case of mayflies. But uh, no arguing with you. It's certainly a lot of fun to get a fish on the dry fly because it's... Uh, you know, sort of 1v1 competition. You make your cast, you get instant feedback on your presentation. They like it, they eat it. They don't like it, they don't eat it. It can be very rewarding, can be very frustrating. But uh, this is a line that's not necessarily an absolute necessity. If you don't envision ever fishing dries and emergers or you just don't see it on your waters, you may want to think about, you, you don't necessarily have to run out and get a floating line just for this. Most of us, when we learn to fly cast, tend to learn on floating lines that are best suited for dries and emergers. So most of us have it typically with us anyway. It's a good line to have. So if you're going to fish dries and emergers or see that you may have a chance on a trip or one day it just lands in your lap, you're going to want to have a line that's best suited for that. So again, there's three lines already. I've got the two for the naked technique and the indicators, and now I've just added a third for fishing dries and emergers. Bear vault is one way to assure your next backcountry trip stays memorable, epic, and safe. Bear vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister that keeps bears and other wild animals away from your food. This in turn keeps your food safe, keeps the bears safe, and keeps you safe. I've got a classic story that I told. I've told a few times about the bear taking my backpack while up in Alaska. I had my lunch and some snacks in there and just went up around the corner to fish for a bit. When I got back, it was uh, totally gone. If I would have had that bear vault right at that moment, I would have been okay because my food would have been completely sealed. The bear would have had no idea and no reason to take my backpack. So a good reminder there. You might not realize it, but this type of thing happens all the time, even to experienced outdoorsmen. The great news for us is now we can experience the great stuff of a remote trip without ever having to worry about animals fiddling with our stuff. Sleep soundly knowing your vault has sealed the deal for you. Believe it or not, food storage is a key consideration while backcountry hiking, fishing, or camping. The Bear Vault also has some great bonus features like the see-through sidewall so you can find your stuff really easy and a large opening plus it doubles as a nice camp stool. This thing is legit. It definitely is one of my, this might be my favorite feature is, is the camp stool. You know, I love a good, a good chair out there. Check in with the crew at Bear Vault at wetflyswing.com slash bear vault. That's Bear Vault, B-E-A-R-V-A-U-L-T. Okay, back to the show. So the next line we're going to talk about is your midge tip or emerger tip lines or clear tip lines, depending on the manufacturer. And what these lines are is a floating line with an integrated, meaning the, the tip section is literally part, you know, 
designed and built right as into the fly line itself. It's nothing loop to loop. There's no, you know, like a, a poly leader or a versi leader where you can put a different tip on there. You can certainly do that, but I like an integrated line just because those loops can uh, bind at guides, um, a little bit of hinging going on. I just prefer the castability of a line that's all integrated. And this floating line with the integrated tip or the midge tip or clear intermediate tip or a merger tip or clear tip line is uh, is the way to go. So these lines can be um, have a clear tip section, and those uh, typically sink maybe at about one and a half inches per second. Or you can get newer ones now have a hover tip that sinks at one inch per second. These sink rates will make more sense on the next episode when we really get into take that little deeper dive into sinking lines. These lines tend to be either a regular core line or a monofilament line because you need that uh, the clear. Uh, mono core so you can have that clear tip section these are an excellent line for fishing naked i love to fish this line in deeper water with long leaders whether i'm fishing you know chronomid larva chronomid pupa caddis pupa things like that i fish minnow patterns with it it's an excellent line in windy conditions you know, when you're fishing long leaders or indicator techniques, casting those longer leaders, both with indicators and the naked technique, can be problematic because we tend to rush our casts. We over-anticipate and overcompensate for the wind. We apply power abruptly and incorrectly. We cause tailing loops. And we get lots of tangles. And with long leaders, you know, a long leader doesn't cast any worse than a shorter leader, but the margin of error for it is certainly less. We also have, and probably more important with this than that, is the um, the surface chop. The impact of the surface chop on those um, floating lines causes you to loss of connection, bounces and dances your fly. Some days they really like that, but a lot of times they don't. So that your fly down below is being influenced by the impact the surface chop has on the line or on the indicator. So these midge tip or emerger tip lines, that tip section, if you will, bites into the surface gets underneath that chop, allows you to stay in contact with your flies so you don't miss takes. If you're fishing them in shallow water situations, I've used these fishing water boatmen and back swimmers, fishing minnow patterns, damselfly nymphs, things like that. I can make that cast, get that tip underneath the water, fish shallow still, keep that fly up near the surface. But if a fish rolls, takes a, you know, a swimming damsel nymph going towards shore, charges a minnow and explodes on it, anything like that, I can uh, quickly pick this up because if I was fishing a sinking line, for example, I'd have to strip that line all the way back in, get it out of the water efficiently so it doesn't make a lot of commotion and get it off to the target. And again, that could cause you to miss that opportunity where that fish moved. Believe it or not, I also fish dries and emergers with this line. So when we fish dries and emergers on lakes, we don't just cast you know, our fly out there and sit patiently and wait for something to find it. Typically, we're fanning our cast from left to right, like we're covering hours on a clock, moving around, casting out, letting that fly sit, sit for a few seconds, 10 or 15 seconds. I might twitch it a little bit, even though, let's say I'm using a mayfly dun, and mayfly duns don't really move on the water like a caddis would go scurrying across the surface. But that little bit of strip or action will draw a fish over, attract it over, see your offering, and eat it. And then we pick it up and put it somewhere else. So um, if you think about how we're presenting that regularly with a floating line, a lot of the dries we use on, uh, you know, particularly sort of English style dries, like a Bob's Bits or a, a, a Hopper or, um, I don't know, Carrot or something like that. These flies, when you look at them, are kind of gangly. They sit in the film or just under the surface film. You know, our dries are different in lakes than they are in rivers and streams because we don't have to deal with the current and have our flies sit up on the current a little bit or deal with the differing current. Um, speeds in a river so they sit lower the fish will also you know feed not only on those uh, surface um, adults but they'll also feed on the emerges in transition and maybe that transition um, that they're focused on on that particular day or portion of the day is just underneath the surface or just as the the insect is half in transition from pupa or nymph to adult those kind of things different profiles so they're a little different. You know, a lot of times they're just dubbing and, a, you know, a, an Indian neck hackle and that's it. They're kind of like more wet fly than dry fly. So we cast these out. We certainly goop them up, gink them up, get them floating and they'll sit there. And again, if we're just using a dry presentation, we might cast it out, let it land, sit for a second, give it a strip. Nothing happens. Pick it up. But using the midge tip, we can cast out with a fly or a team of flies. They're going to sit on the surface. 
Eventually, that midge tip or that emerger tip is going to pull those flies under. They're going to sink. And the second they go under the surface film, we start a slow, steady hand twist or pinch strip retrieve and bring those flies and track them back just subsurface in the zone where the fish are feeding. So this presentation allows you to keep your flies where the fish are feeding. There also, this line is very popular for fishing a technique called the washing line. And the washing line, if you're familiar with a dry dropper in North America, where you have a, you know, a buoyant dry fly, and then off of that dry fly, either off the hook eye or the bend, you tie a, a weighted nymph or pupa and fish that below. And the um, fish can come up and eat the dry. The dry can serve as an, an indicator. Um, oh, and it can also help um, by the length of tippet you use to attach that weighted fly off the bend or the hook eye or off an independent dropper, the length of that tippet governs how deep that fly will fish. It's, it's one type of indicator, if you will. But the washing line has the buoyant fly on the point, right? And it's used to suspend other flies, traditional, you know, weighted nymphs, for example, or a weighted pupa pattern off an independent dropper. So in conjunction with the line choice and the buoyant fly on the point, and the buoyant fly can be a fab, a fomars blob, a favorite of mine, or a booby, something like that, and they hang the other flies off the droppers like clothes on a washing line. That's where it gets its name from. An example of this was last fall. I was fishing uh, Sheridan Lake in the Island Park area of Idaho. It was warm. Coronamids were still emerging, and the fish were randomly um, moving around. Uh, and that's one of the problems on a clear, calm, or light wind day is those, the wind doesn't channel the trout movement. Wind creates uh, induced wind creates current. Trout in lakes are river and it's in their DNA. They're uh, river and stream creatures at heart, and they like to swim into the wind. It's one of the ways to anticipate when you see a fish roll where to place your fly to intercept it is to th consider always upwind because that's the direction the trout is most likely going to travel. Do they travel in other directions? Sure they do, but when it's calm and little to no wind, they meander more. There's no wind to channel their movement or make them more predictable. So I had fish rising, you know, not a ton, but enough to, you know, get my attention, but they were inconsistent. They'd rise to the left. They'd rise in front of me. They'd rise further out. They'd rise close in. They'd rise behind me. They were all over the place. It was difficult to predict. If I put an adult coronamid on and tried to, uh, you know, target those rises, I, I probably would have driven myself to fits because the fish were totally inconsistent, so difficult to predict where to put the fly. But what I decided to do, because the trout were also feeding on the pupa as they wiggled and got up to the surface and then suspended momentarily just beneath the surface and then pushed through the surface film to hatch, the fish were feeding on them too. And of course, the fish were also feeding on those midges as they ascend up through the water column. So they were used to seeing them. So I put on a fab, a fomars blob, which is, if you're familiar with English uh, blob patterns, this has got a split foam tail, sinks a little faster than a booby. You can certainly use a booby in this situation. Put it on the midge tip. I used a hover tip. Put it on there. Uh, about five feet in front of the, um, the fab, I hung about on four to six inches of independent dropper. I hung a regular little bead-headed chromie, about a size 14. And I cast that out, it landed delicately, I let it sit there for a second, and then I started a very slow hand twist retrieve. And I took a lot of fish that way because I was able to cover water, I wasn't driving myself to fits trying to cover all those different rises, but I was tracking my flies through the zone they were fishing. And you can fish a washing line at the surface like I have, just below the surface, mid-depth, just above the bottom, on a variety of different line types. And what it basically allows you to do is keep your flies at a set depth, similar to an indicator, but allows you to move them horizontally because they could be eating mayfly nymphs, damselfly nymphs, dragonfly nymphs, or you just want to use that buoyant fly on the point to suspend other flies just above the weed tops. It's a great presentation for that as well. So a midge or a merger tip line, very popular to use the washing line technique um, with this line. It's probably, when I look at Stillwater fly lines, perhaps the, one of the most underrated Stillwater lines out there, but one of the most valuable ones. This is one I have a real love of and uh, strongly recommend getting. So where are we at with our line count right now? As I mentioned, we've got two floating lines suited for one for indicators, one for casting the naked technique long leaders. So that's those lines with the the mass in the head, oversized heads, short front tapers to facilitate turning over those systems. Then I have a floating line for dries and emergers. 
And then I have my midge emerger tip, but I don't just have one. I have a midge tip because they do come in different lengths and different densities. So I've got a midge tip, a three foot midge tip that sinks at an inch and a half per second. I've got a six foot midge tip, a clear midge tip that sinks at an inch and a half per second. I have a midge tip, a three footer that's a hover tip that sinks at one inch per second. And then I have a hover midge tip that sinks at one inch per second, but it's six feet long. So there's four different types of midge tips plus those two floating lines for um, the naked technique and strike indicators and for drives and emergers. So what are we at there? We're at seven lines already. So you can see how this starts to pile up. Again, don't get frustrated. I'm going to, in, at the end of the second episode of this, when I summarize all of my thoughts on still water lines, give you some guidance as to the critical pass, sort of the three core lines you should have in your kit bag with you at any one time, and then you can build your inventory up from there. Again, as your budget allows, as your wants and needs dictate as well. Think of it like golf clubs. You can probably, you know, golf successfully, and by I am no means a good golfer, um, more of a, you know, a, gr a lot of dirt clumps flying everywhere. My ball's disappearing into water traps. Maybe that's the fly fisher in me. But you could probably golf with your favorite wood, your favorite iron, uh, a sand wedge uh, to get you out of sand traps, and a putter. And you'd probably cover a lot of golfing situations. But you're going to get on those certain holes or in those certain, you know, shot challenges where a specific club is going to help out. And that, if you think about fly lines that way, that's the same way as well. You're going to have those lines at your disposals. So that's what we've covered today. This is episode one. We've touched on why um, you see so many more fly lines, still water fishing, than you do with other disciplines of fly fishing, particularly river and stream trout fishermen that can, uh, you know, probably get away with a floating line for most of their uh, presentations. They can fish dries with that. They can nymph with it. They can swing wet flies with it, all that kind of stuff. But compared to lake anglers, we've Got a little few more lines with us in our kit bag. We talked about why you'd want to do that, you know, being versatile, being able to cover different presentation challenges, different methods, personal choice. Only the paranoid survive, I said, of course, when you see another angler or a colleague using a certain type of line that you don't have and being successful with it, it certainly makes you want to go out and get it. And again, when you get these new lines, experiment and learn how to use them when the fishing is pretty good simply because the next time you're out in the water and things aren't going exactly according to plan then you can um, you know have confidence that you've used that line in the past when fishing was good and have a better understanding how to use it and that might unlock the key if you will on that trip when things aren't quite going according to plan and fish aren't being as cooperative so i hope you enjoyed today's episode i hope you understand a little bit better about fly line tapers cores we talked about floating lines and midge tip lines, emerger tip lines um, for different scenarios. We got up to a line count of seven. On our next episode, we're going to be taking a bit of a deep dive into sinking lines, different sink rates, talking about inches per second, countdown, things like that, sweep lines, density compensation, all of that stuff. So I hope you'll be able to join me. Hopefully you found the content within today's episode helpful. Take some of the mystery, demystified fly lines, if you will, making sense of them. That's the title of this line part one we hope you enjoy it thanks for uh, dropping by and, and catching one of my littoral zone podcasts there's other episodes to pick up as well lots of other great information to help you improve your still water fly fishing so until next time get out on the water try out some of these lines catch a few fish and we'll talk to you next episode about sinking lines and summarize this all up thanks for listening stay safe out there that was Phil Roy on the Littoral Zone, part of the Wet Fly Swing podcast and Swing Outdoors. I wanted to give Phil a big thank you for another great episode. I hope this special series gives us a chance to let Phil up the level for all of us through this podcast. You can send any feedback you have to me, dave at wetflyswing.com, or check in with Phil anytime. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast series, and I can't wait till we get the next episode of the Littoral Zone out there. One big reminder, we are going to be doing some Stillwater schools around the country. If you're interested, anytime you can check in wetflyswing.com slash Stillwater School and uh, you can find out where we're heading next. All right. Thanks for stopping in today. See you on the next episode of The Littoral Zone.